Welcome! This is Unfolding, the show where I talk to creative business minds. My name is Marco Pfann and today we are back at Dixon Buxy and we are talking to Simon. Today we are back at Dixon Buxy in London and we are talking to Simon Dixon, the co-founder. And what I want to know is um, how Dixon Buxy managed to lead their clients into, well, let's say, how they help them to change through branding and through design. And yeah, welcome, Simon. How are you? Thank you. Very well indeed. Thanks for chatting to me again. Appreciate it. So my, my main question is really, um, so today I want to talk about creative leadership. Okay. And the, the, the question I have is, how do you help your talents to be able to lead your clients? Oh, that's a really big... Broad, I know, we always start with the big yeah, questions. Nice, big, broad question to start with. Um, it breaks into a number of things, I think. Um, the first of which is the relationship you have with a client before you work with them. So it's about curating relationships because you could work with many people and a client could work with many agencies, but that might not necessarily be a, a cultural chemistry fit, a creative fit, an ambition fit, or an opportunity fit. And that's what we look for. So when we speak to people, we speak to hundreds of people a year, we look for, can we make a difference? Do we have a matched ideal of the level of opportunity in the brief? Mm -hmm. Is there a shared ambition to move things further? Because that's what we profess to do and what we love to do. And then if you do that, there's not a mismatch when you start the project. There's, you've already, in a sense, bonded over that idea. Okay. Um, and that applies to the working relationship and the brief. So when we look at a brief, we look at what's behind the brief, the problem that we're solving, not the literal brief. Mm -hmm. And then our team, in a sense, is in the early phase of the creative process. Our job is to create a safe space for people to feel that they can talk about greater change early on. So the idea that you can go further to come back to a place which works better. And it's about, in a sense, listening to people and creating a very collaborative space where people feel safe enough to think about what the future of something is. And in a, in a sense, prototype that in their heads and prototype that visually and conceptually. And that change doesn't feel as scary then. Are you... Why doesn't it, this feel scary to them? I mean, they still have to talk to the client, right? Well, I'm talking about both people. I'm talking about both the clients and our team. So <clears throat> if you think about a client, mm -hmm. they're under huge duress and stress mm -hmm. <clears throat> when they're going through a brand change program. Yes. There's a massive weight on their shoulders. Yes. So our job is to take that weight off their shoulders mm -hmm. and say, look, let us carry that weight for a while. Let, let us look at the, these problems. Let us look at what's driving the brief and why you need to change and the benefits of the change to the organization and the people the organization serves, the end user. And let's talk about that. And in that process, our team is used to the uncomfortable nature sometimes of the early phases where people are a little bit apprehensive about going too far. And it's honesty, it's about the value of change, it's about the effect of change, and it's very collegiate, it's very conversational. Our meetings are working sessions. Uh, the work is delivered against the expectancy of the work rather than just timings and deadlines. So we want to make everything about the creative process being very optimistic, very inspiring, and about making the most of whatever we're doing with the client. So compared to other studios, I know you're, you're focusing much more on the creative process in terms of actually in workshops, collaborating mm -hmm. with the client. Is that right? Like, yeah. And as I, what I heard is like you actually frame the whole conversation and the whole thing in the beginning. So it's not about the brief, but it's why you want to do this. Yeah. Does this engage the client? Does this kind of um, connect the client to the project better? I think so. It's hard to know how other people work because I've only ever run my own studios. Um, so I don't know how other agencies work, but I'm guessing it's a similar thing, which is the early phase of the creative process is about bonding with people. It's about understanding the different dynamics uh, culturally of how people work. Mm -hmm. It's also about the idea of what drives the brief, because the brief often is very mechanical. Yeah. It's a fixed set of challenges, it's deadlines, it's dates, it's numbers, it's very pragmatic. And then there's a list of things they'd love to do with lots of really cool phrases on, you know, values and propositions and things like that. Yeah. 
But there's, a, there's usually something behind that, which is connecting to new people, launching a new product. The world and the industry has outrun the business, so they're not fit for purpose anymore. There's much bigger drivers to that. So when we start to discuss those bigger topics, and there's a shared understanding that it's, it's okay, we all know where we're going, then you can start to talk about how you solve those problems and how you use strategy, the translation of strategy into design and communication systems to solve that. And it becomes very much a conversation then, rather than a series of incremental presentations where we try and force an agenda. Okay, so it's more iterative, like you yeah. build up on them. So when a client comes to you, do, are they actually aware that they need a change management process? Yeah, you, th we wouldn't be hired unless people understand. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that, that, that needs doing. Our clients are very sophisticated. In most instances, much more intelligent and smarter than we are. But what we have is objectivity. Uh -huh. So from the moment I meet someone on a phone call, so how it works is I'll, I'll talk to lots of different people, as I said, all over the world. Initially with no agenda, I might, I might know someone 10 years before I work, them, work, work with them, but they might remember something from that conversation about how we look at creativity collectively with the clients and things like that, and the power of creativity to change businesses. Mm -hmm. And then the contact is we have a chemistry session And it's like, do they like us? That's, that's really, it's like dating. Yeah. You'd have a few conversations. It's like, how's that go? Yeah, it's not bad. And then you have some more serious conversations and they say, well, we have a brief. Okay, okay, we'll have a look at the brief. And then we have an actual conversation about what the problem is. And in that, we lean in. We say, look, we see this in your brief, but really, is that what's driving it? What's the, what's, what's the issue at hand? Mm. And then often we'll, we don't pitch work, so we would do a proposal. And it's a reaction to the brief, but it's like contentions that we see in terms of how we would shape the response to the brief. And often in that, we go further than the brief. We maybe suggest ways of working, insights we've gathered or experience we have about how to shape the problem differently. And that builds trust with the client. And that's really what it's about, is building trust that collectively we can solve the problem together. And they can also look at our body of work and go, they've done it before with other people. So basically, you, you actually go deeper. They come with a brief and you go deeper, you look behind the problem, but that you build the trust. Yeah. Um, they need a reason to believe they should work with us. Okay. What's that reason? Well, it depends on the specific client. But if you, if, say you laid five agencies out yeah. and you look to their work, at the level we operate on, everyone's really good. Yeah. And most people are really, really good. So it's like a selection box then, isn't it? Which is red one, blue one, green one. And they've all done great brands. But how that work is made is really interesting because often you can make a brand that when it's delivered, it looks great. Yeah. But once it's used, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why? Um, the, it's not been tested well enough. It's not driven by the right ideas. It's too surface. Um, it's siloed, so it only works for the yeah. brand, but it doesn't work for a product. Um, it's campaign led rather than brand led. There's many reasons it doesn't work. Um, so for us, it's about an integrated process where it's how strategy drives a design engine, which is implemented across an entire ecosystem that connects. And it's thoroughly tested to make sure it works both intellectually and creatively. And it's about how it serves the audience. So that reason to believe is those conversations, which is um, we will go further with greater degree of energy and enthusiasm potentially than someone else, or you like us more, or you like the body of work, but you like the feeling of how we work. And I think we win more of our work from how we work rather than just the style of the work. Because mm -hmm. very often when I meet people, I'm never asked to show work. That's interesting. They just talk. They've seen our work, obviously. They wouldn't yeah. come to us unless they've seen the But work. you don't pitch the work, right? No, no. You don't, no. You don't have to prove yourself when you're in no. that room. No, we have to prove that um, our, our thinking and creative uh -huh. problem solving and, and the way we express ourselves will solve this specific problem. So it's about listening and gathering insight uh -huh. and being receptive to what they say, but being then objective when we have a response. So that's much more about the strategy, right? That's like yeah. the strategic part. Exactly. Actually going behind the design and then actually... And it's yeah. also a creative leadership. Yeah. Because we work at a very executive level and those people have very short attention spans, huge pressures. Um, they're trying to make dynamic, quick and important change in their businesses because they wouldn't be changing otherwise. So it's about how we can run alongside them and help them with that momentum. And we take every problem and flip it to an opportunity. 
So that mm -hmm. it's, it's about the shifts you make to change the brand. And we like those to be optimistic, positive and dynamic and make faster, greater change because that's what they need. And then you phase greater change after that. So look for big wins, follow up with medium term success and then do, develop long term growth. And often people pick one or the other. Oh, you have different... No, we, we try and do all three. We, uh, that's, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about like the leadership. So... When you implement change and when you do a rebranding, um, it's oftentimes a long-term process, right? It's not yeah. like done within three weeks or three months even. So how, may, how can you make sure that you involve the leadership of the company, of the, the brand you're working the, the for? The client yeah, company. The client company. Um, we, ask to, we ask initially um, to speak to the stakeholders. So often when we first, uh, first engage, we'll be speaking with a direct sponsor, the person who is responsible for the project. Mm -hmm. That'll be creative leadership, production leadership, uh, maybe strategic leadership, and, and of, often that's under the wing of marketing or brand. Yeah. And a lot of the projects we're dealing with, there's a product leadership as well, so there's the digital aspect of it as, as well in terms of the, those products. Um, but then beyond them is their leadership. So our job is to figure out how we serve the immediate needs of the sponsor group, but we also think about the business drivers rather than just the brand drivers. So the strategies we create are, are, are business problem solving rather than just communication solving yeah. problems. We do both. Um, and then, you know, as you develop the contentions and the way of looking at the strategy, what you want to be doing is building executive summaries that are reasons to believe in those strategies and mm. root them back. That's nice. To why we call them reasons to be brave. Reason, so, oh, that's that's perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so the first phase, uh, we listen uh, in our initiate phase, and then we play back what, what we call what we've heard. So we play back all the insights we've gathered from stakeholder meetings. And that will be people on the ground floor who are running the business at a ground level. That will be the most senior CEOs, board level people, yeah. and the people who are directly sponsoring it. So we want a sample group throughout the company. And then we play that back to them and say, look, this is what we've heard. And what happens is everybody can hear their voice, but, but the response is an amalgamation of those voices, yeah. not a single one. So it helps build consensus because everybody's listened to, but we take the most pertinent and the most, most important things to create the shifts we need. We then develop those insights into the reasons to be brave, which is basically the drivers of the strategic engine. And they're the shifts that will actually deliver the strategy long-term for the business. And we see it as a long-term engine. It's not a campaignable idea or a big fix or a big buzz phrase. It's a series of habits and behaviors that drive the business long-term. And we're taking people on a journey. So for the executives, they can see that we'll be better engaging an audience, we'll be solving their problem. But we need to get it into a soundbite, an idea that is very easy to buy conceptually. Yeah. So we don't sell the idea, it should sell itself. Mm -hmm. We communicate and the you benefit. Get, you find the idea by actually talking to people. Yeah, exactly. And so, so you actually spend a lot of time researching, talking to different stakeholders within the company. Yeah, and the audience. And, and the audience as and well. And the industry. So, you, uh, like, uh, so we, look at, we look at four things. There's many things we look at. Yeah. But we look at the company, yeah. how the company's structured, we audit that and look at um, how they function. Often they're siloed, so how do they communicate? Uh, we talk to leadership, we talk to different people. Um, we look at the cultural landscape, behavioral shifts in people, uh, what's mm -hmm. happening the in market, the world, okay. the market. We look at the competitive set, mm -hmm. the industry that they're in, and then we look at the people that it serves, the customer. Um, and often a brand will have relationships which are monetized, but they'll have lots of relationships that are not. It's a very complex, sometimes it'd be a consumer and a business relationship. Um, so we look at all of those things and from those insights, we create the matrix of how to solve whatever problem it is. So this, that's the ob objectivity, right? That's yeah. the outside perspective yeah. and you actually give them yeah. a mirror, right? They, yeah. they and we meet real mirror. people, so we'll meet the audience yeah. and we meet the client and we go out. So we have a lot, all of our clients have huge amounts of data and research. Yeah. But you need to humanize and make it real and make it tangible because everybody's got the data, everybody's got the information, yes. but finding a way with cr creating that sense of perspective and distinction around a strategy that fits a brand is actually quite tricky. Yes. You know, the audience needs a reason to believe in their promise. So we have to figure that out and how that connects to them. 
how the how the reason to believe, how the reason to be brave connects yeah, well, well, inside and outside, both together. Yeah, That's exactly. Good. Three audiences for mm. a brand. There's the internal team. Yeah. So they need to be motivated to deliver the brand yeah. on behalf of the people they serve. There's business relationships, business partnerships for most businesses. And then there is the end user. So there's three key audiences. And they're quite complex because it can be multiple end user audiences. There's lots of different parts of the business and there's lots of business relationships, but all need to benefit from the process. What would happen if you wouldn't include the internal teams? What then would happen with the brand that you create? If we didn't include them? Yeah. Just want to make a point here. Um, we wouldn't have the correct information. Yes. Um, they wouldn't care about it. And, and what it would, if they wouldn't care about it? What, what happens? Is this a test? No, I'm just, I'm just make, trying to make a point <laughs> yeah. for the audience. Uh, yeah. I'm not testing you. <laughs> I do have an answer. The, um, it, will, it won't communicate outwards yeah. because, of course, the internal people are uh, not only are the guardians, but they're the spokespeople for the brand. If you, if you get everybody in, inspired about the idea of how the brand functions and how it serves people, yeah. they'll be more creative, more innovative, they'll be proud of the brand, proud and this, the brand, they'll stand yeah. taller, and they will serve the brand better. Mm -hmm. They will feel part of something that is meaningful, mm -hmm. and they will feel part of something that is dynamic and changing and making the world a better place and helping people. So part of your creative leadership is actually including a client and all the decisions from, from top to bottom. Um, and, and creating something together. Yes. And when we talk about your talents, um, how are they involved in this process? Our team? Yeah, your team. So we have a one team process where the producer facilitates the relationship. Um, they're the ones who uh, deliver the process and have a very mm -hmm. close okay. relationship. And then we have a lead creative, a lead strategist, um, and we'll, we usually have um, a writer and some motion team and then other people on the project. And they start at the beginning and go all the way through. So the core team is the team that works in the project. Mm -hmm. So that rapport and relationship that's built remains the whole way through. So as we're gathering, the strategic teams gathering insight, the design teams, the motion teams, the writers, voice teams, the producers mm -hmm. are all seeing that information. So everyone's privy to it. So our strategies do, just go, here's a strategy, yeah. go make it. Yeah. The whole picture. team is doing that. And then when the design starts, the strategies are involved in that. Uh, as we go into implementation, everybody yeah. makes sure it's, it, it's still delivering against the goals. And because of that continuity, there's a great cohesion. And the same thing applies to the client relationship. We bring them in and out consistently so that everybody believes and continues to see the entire process and the growth of it and the benefits of it. So it's a very overlapped and, uh, as I say, collegiate process. So they, they're really taking responsibility not only for their, their part, their design, but actually for the whole process. Exactly. And actually the, the, the outcome for exactly. the client, right, for the brand. Yeah, because creativity is a very personal thing. It validates yeah. you. So you, to, to do work that is really meaningful, you have to feel like you're bringing something of yourself. Yes. But you have to do that in a collaborative team environment. There's always a push and pull between the individual's desire to make something that is unique and special for them as a creative, mm -hmm. but also doing that in, as part of teamwork and as a professional creative with a client and the client team. Because most of our clients have very complex internal creative teams yes. as well, so we're collaborating with them all the time. So in a sense, there's a nice synergy between our talent and their talent. And everybody needs to see the benefit of the individual share of voice, everyone having a share of voice, so they feel like they're involved. But you aggregate their voices together and make something amazing from that. And how do you, like, how do you create this culture in, in, like in the in-house here? How do you create a culture, a team that everyone is free to speak? Actually, for most creatives, it's actually hard to be brave, right? To, they they want to know where they have to land. They want to know exactly what to do. The yeah. Creatives usually are not too keen on taking too many risks. How do you manage that? It depends on what type of creative you are. Mm -hmm. um, what you need is a mix of different perspectives and backgrounds. So the, the, the more diverse the, the group of people around the table, the better. Okay, that's nice. You want that table to be level. So there isn't a hierarchy to it. So clearly some people will do certain roles, but in any room that we're in, 
my voice should be as, just as equal to an intern's, mm -hmm. and that's how we see it. And it takes time because obviously, when you're more senior, you have more gravity. You're like a dwarf star. You can yeah. resonate energy, so you have to dial that down. So um, whatever enthusiasm you have, you've got to make sure that everybody has room to be oh, part of that. Yeah. And it takes time. It's literally we talk about this every single day to make sure people don't lose their way, feel like they're disconnected, then they're not overwhelmed by the process. So it's a constant reiteration that this is a safe space to work. Everybody is valid. Lots of talking about the work, lots of physical laying the work out, letting it float around the room so that you might see something through the corner of the eye. Lots of systemization. What do you like? What do you love? A lot of questions. So rather than going, I like this, I don't like that, I'll say, what do you feel about this work? Mm. And you get an emotion response. What do you think is missing, maybe? Okay. Is there anything we haven't found yet? Is there anything here that you feel is particularly connecting to the strategy? And if you ask those questions, people can have a response and an answer. If you come in and say, well, I don't like this font and this blue is a bit dark, that's not creativity. It's a statement there. Right? Yeah, like... it's, it's a cul-de-sac. Yeah. So I don't like cul-de-sacs. What you need to do is create open space for people to go further. And also make mistakes. Make, you have to make shit work to make good work. Yeah, you have to make good work to make great work. So you have to make a lot of crap before you get to anything new. So you have to have the confidence to do that. And it's really uncomfortable. It's hard. So you just have to build a muscle. It's like lifting weights. The yeah. first time you lift a weight, you get an ache in your arm. That's you building muscle. It's the same thing in your head. It, the first time you do it, your head's like, oh my God. So you go, it's okay. It's like, that's just your brain getting used to the fact that you're going to put yourself yeah. out there. True. So that's, that's the answer. So what I've noticed, like a big part of your leadership is asking questions. So it's really just said with the team, you ask them basic coaching questions, like what do you, what do you think, what's missing? Um, I assume that's something you do with your clients too. Yeah, I, I think things like loaded, leadership and coaching are very loaded words. Yeah, they are. Um, I'm not super fond of them because um, I'm, not, I'm not asking questions as a coach or a leader, I'm asking a question as a friend and a colleague and a co-collaborator. Um, I don't like leading. I think it's, the job is to create the space for people to create. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in some instances, if there's something difficult happens with the company, yeah. I'll jump on the hand grenade, that's my job. Yeah. But outside of that, um, it's about creating a space where you're just having a, a creative conversation and I'm not leading anything, the team is leading it. Mm -hmm. um, the creative director is leading in the sense of the vision of the overall project. The strategist is leading the facilitation yeah. of the strategy. The producer is leading the facilitation of how the job is done. The head of copy is leading the voice. But the team is leading the project. But I don't like leadership. I think it's too heavy. It's too loaded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit toxic. It's a bit masculine. It's, it's got that. I think of Elon Musk and people like that. I don't like that stuff. No, what I like about this is like you actually help people to develop, right? Those yeah. questions actually Absolutely. help people to think di differently, maybe even like yeah. have a new perspective, um, to just get out of their, of their own way sometimes. Yeah, and the reason I uh, react to those words is those words are about me. And I think mm. the problem is most people think about themselves. When they need, yes. Yeah, and that's not the job. You have to okay. think about the people, not you. So if, if I'm a coach, it feels like I'm in control and I'm, hey, I'm making those people better. Look what yeah. I did. Yes, yes, and yes. It's narcissistic, it's self-obsessive, mm -hmm. and it's about me. I care about them, so I try to reduce my size. Yeah. And I don't even have a title for that reason. So I can give people advice, I can mentor and coach people clearly, because I'm deeply experienced at what I do. But I don't want to be thinking about me, I'm thinking about them and they should be thinking about the problem solving of the project. Mm -hmm. If you come in with a hat on, your judgment is potentially clouded. Well, clouded to the hat you're wearing. Yeah. So you're giving them a lot of space to experiment, yeah. to, to fail, to try and yeah. to get better. Um, it's a trust thing. Yeah, talk yeah. about that. Because when you start, first start handing over work to people, when you move up the, yeah. the kind of experience ladder, you find it hard to give it over because you think, I could do that better than them because I'm more experienced or like, wow, I should leap in and help them. Mm. So what you've got to allow is for the fact they'll do it differently to you. Yeah. And they need to make the same mistakes you did in order to learn. You can't tell them about that. They've got to live them. Yeah. So you've got to allow that to happen. And, it, and it's, it can be a little um, 
scary sometimes, but you've just got to trust that people will learn from that and develop. So it's a very trust-based thing. Sounds like parenting a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a parent, so... You're not a parent. Okay, but it's kind of like going through the same mistakes, like letting... You actually have to... Yeah, it's to part of the human them. condition, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. You learn a lot by doing. It depends who you are. Different people learn different ways. Right. Some people learn through writing, some physical, some need to live it, some like reading about it. So you have to account for different ways of assimilating knowledge yeah. and learning. So we have a very physical as well as a digital environment. We have different types of sessions, which are some are quick, some are longer. Um, we're constantly talking about duration and how those, the flow of those, those kind of workshops and sessions work for that very reason, to make sure that there's a good rhythm that everybody can learn and adapt different ways, lots of one-to-ones and things like that. Some of it's just emotional, which is you come in some days and you're a bit flat. Yeah. You just come in some days you're full of beans and you're like into it. You know, so you have to account for the fact that people's emotional context really affects how they can create. So where did you learn all this? Like, it's just, not it's not the typical way. I don't uh, know. I've never, seen, I've never worked anywhere else. You so. never worked anywhere. Okay. I mean, to be honest with you, I've learned by making thousands of mistakes. Right. So I started my first agency when I was 19. So I was clearly neither experienced, smart enough, or educated enough to do that. I didn't go to university. So I just learned by doing, and then I probably ran studios really badly for at least a decade or longer and finally figured one version out and then figured a better version out. So, you know, if I look back at my career, it's quite humbling because I look back and think, wow, I probably wasn't very good here and here at, at this part of what I do. I was really good at the creating part, mm -hmm. but not the, not the kind of creating space for people to create part of me. So you just have to learn. And, you know, I read a lot. I, I talk to hundreds of people a year. Mm -hmm. So whenever I talk to them, I'm learning something off them. I mean, in this instance, you're asking a lot of questions, but yeah. if you and I were just having a conversation, there'd be something I take away from that. And I, I know for a fact that since we've known each other, I've learned things off you. And it's that aggregation of knowledge that helps me do what I do. What's, I mean, you, you so talking, still talking about creative leadership. Um, what can creatives do to be better in leading their clients, leading their team members? What is something that they really like? What do you think is missing in today's creative culture when it comes to I, leading, I, helping? Whatever yeah, I'm not it. fond of like um, things missing or being negative because there's so many different ways of creating. So I don't think any one person should project a particular way. Mm -hmm. The things I think about is. It's, it starts with hiring people. So it starts with, in the same way with working with clients. So whether you're hiring people or you're, you're hoping to gain a client, it's about finding that there's a mutual respect and mutual perspective um, rather than just doing it. Because if you hire somebody and there's a, a disconnect between what they expect and what you expect, they'll fall out of the agency and they won't like it. Beautiful. And the same with the client. So when I'm interviewing someone, um, I will ask them a series of questions. Usually I'll just talk. I will never look at their work. I won't look at the CV. I'll just talk to them for 20 minutes about life, things, whatever they want to talk about. And then I'll turn it over to them and say, you can now ask me any question you want. And they can interview me for 15, 20 minutes. Ooh, that's, that's interesting. What do they ask? What, everyone asks like me. Or? There's like three or four questions that everyone always asks. But what's really interesting is, Once they've got past the two or three obvious questions, yeah. the questions they ask afterwards yeah. tell me a lot about whether or not they'd ah. be suitable here. And I use that as a gauge. This, the other thing I think about is, if I'm flying to New York and they're sat on the plane next to me, would I enjoy the flight? That's nice. Have, have a good conversation if I do. You probably have to travel with them someday, right? Yeah, and even if I didn't, conceptually, I imagine that. And if I imagine that being a good conversation, I'm halfway yeah. there to hire them. Yeah, that's actually... So I hire for, the person, hire for the person, we could teach skills, mm -hmm. we can give people knowledge, but we can't teach them passion. The second thing is trusting them to do their job. We hide them for a reason, so we should tr trust them to deliver. We should understand that they can't work the way we work, they can work under the auspices of what we do, of what we do but we should let them create the way, the way they want to within mm -hmm. our process. We should allow them to feel safe if they make a mistake. We should uh, inspire them to go further than they've gone before. They should consistently work uncomfortable to come back to the right space. Um, 
we should have a very open and frank communication and uh, lots of communication and conversation. That's something we talk about all the time. And it's about a shared vision, which is we're going to go over there and do something we haven't done before. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn while we're doing that. And we're going to make something that is going to excite us and it's going to change us and it's going to change the brand and it's going to change the audience's perception of that brand. And it's going to be worth doing. And at the end of it, we're going to look back and go, that was worth doing. We're proud of that work. Forget awards, titles, all that stuff. Did you make something that you're proud of? And if you did, then it was worth doing. And let's go do that again, but not do the same thing. Let's make something different this time. Always, always staying on the edge, like being hungry. Being hungry, wanting people. to learn, yeah. not wanting to atrophy. There's a rampant sea of sameness out there. Everybody can see everything. AI is going to come along and hoover up the bottom of that. Probably. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so you have to be in the top part of it. Mm -hmm. There's a bit, it's um, a triangle. I think I've said this to you before, but the bottom is shit. <laughs> then it's mediocre, average, good, great, excellent. So and up, up here is the best, it's ideation, idiosyncrasy, human drivers, Ah, the really amazing things. In the great is the best of us. Then it gets down to systemization. Then it gets down to commoditization and the widgety stuff. AI is going to eat the bottom part of yeah. both of those things. So if you aspire to be in the top, you'll feel alive and you'll be making a greater difference. And it's more than just the design, right? It's like a it's not, not designing behind. for money. It's not designing yeah. as a job. It's not designing for money. You want both of those things. But you're designing to make a difference. You're designing to feel alive. You're creating things which are meaningful and useful and powerful and exciting and potent. It's emotional and the hairs on the back of your neck should stand up. What I love about your process is you're much more in tune and connected with your clients and most other studios. So you, and actually- I don't know you, that's you take, the case. I don't know that's the case. I know lots of agencies that are very connected to their clients. At the high level, probably? Yeah, maybe. But there's, yeah, still, yeah. <laughs> there's still a lot of, like, I actually... I know think, what you mean. And I, mean, I, think I that, don't that's, mean to be... Uh, no, but no, I mean, that's, some, that's an issue. And I think we have to point this out. Like, if you, do great, if you want to do great work, you have to be connected to the client. I agree, I agree. You can't do great work unless you truly trust the client and respect them. And the, the client trusts you, right? It's like it, you clearly, yeah. It, it's a reciprocal thing. There's a weird thing in our industry where people moan about clients. Yes. They go, oh, this client stopped me this, this client won't let me do this. They're giving me feedback. That's their fucking job. Yeah. That's literally their job. It is. And all the great work in the, the industry, all the black pencil winners, all the Clio winners, all the things everyone looks at on the internet, go, that's amazing. We're sponsored by a client. So it's either you've got great clients or you haven't got great clients. If you have clients who don't understand the power of creativity or the value of creativity, you have the wrong clients. So you can actually only create great work if you have great clients and... Of course. And it's not, it's not the client's job to be great, it's kind of your job, job to get them there, right? No, they are great. So, so the people we work with are really smart, yeah. super creative people. But they have a different job to us. The, the, their job is to run the business, run the, the, business the yeah. creativity, and our job is to be objective and help them systemize that. So it's just it's a mutual respect thing. Well, I could go on forever, um, but I think we're running out of time. Okay. I still have one more question for you. Um, same like last time. What advice would you give to your competitors when we talk about creative leadership. Competitors? Competitive or even the creative industry in China? Yeah, um, I don't think about competition, only in the sense that I think there's a lot of room for everyone. Nice. So I think it's plenty of space. And uh, we don't compete with anyone, we don't pitch. So we get our work based on our merits, and yeah. if they get their work based on their merits, then great. So I think competition is a waste of energy. Um, the advice I would, be, I would give, and it's the same advice I always give, which is, Work the way you want to work. Create the work you want to work with the people who want yeah. to work and the things that satisfy you and figure out what that is and you'll be happy. Just don't do what people tell you to do and don't just work for money and don't just work to work. It's worth the effort, I think, to find the type of work and the way you want to work with the people you want to work with and keep doing that and change and develop and grow and get better at what you do mm. than just to exist. It's pointless. <laughs> It's pointless, that's true. Well, thank you, Simon. That was amazing again. You're welcome. Um, yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks, thanks for your insights. Yeah, real pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Marco Pfann and I hope
hope to see you all again on our next show where we unfold creative business minds.